Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Uncommon Sense. I'm Junior Doan and I'm thrilled you could join us. My guest today is Dr. Kevin Cahill, a tropical medicine specialist who has worked alongside Mother Teresa and is known for his relief work in war zones such as Somalia, Sudan, and Nicaragua. Welcome, Dr. Thank Cahill. You. Uh, you redefine the role of physician from healer, as it were, to the nexus of public policy humanitarian efforts. How did you come to that um, point of view? I don't think it was a point of view. I think it was <clears throat> a series of accidents, like most of life is a series of accidents. Yeah. I was trained as a physician, but my specialty in tropical medicine got me doing refugee work, KM very early, uh, large, large refugee camps. And then when I came back to this country after a number of years in Africa, Various circumstances allowed me to take on public policy jobs. I was in charge of health and mental health in the state of New York for one six-year period. And to give you one idea, there were 80,000 employees and a budget of $8 billion. But the principles really aren't very different from what you deal with when you're dealing in a refugee camp. You have to identify your problems. You have to see what your resources are. You have to spread it out as best you can. And so I've always found challenges, whether here in the United States or particularly overseas where I've worked most of my productive life. And I now run an institute training humanitarian workers. And I have over 3,000 graduates from 135 nations. So I think of all of the things I've done, that will be the one that brings me the greatest pleasure because they're the ones out on the front lines. And it's the 135 nations rather than just the big nations that really matter. In setting up this new program, which has been in existence for a while, what did you learn that uh, in training that you had to moderate or emphasize? That medicine was not the whole field at all. In other words, in running refugee camps, shelters, sanitation, logistics, security, and so a lot of the background that you bring to a problem like a refugee camp is more in anthropology, comparative literature, than in biochemistry or microbiology. So it's a, they're the very different fields, but I think they're all part of our lives. We, don't, we shouldn't narrow ourselves. We, we shouldn't put up artificial borders and say, I'm a physician, I'm a citizen. I, can, I work in areas where if I didn't speak my mind, for example, as a, if you have a diplomatic opportunity in Africa because of the work you do, I remember when I first started writing, someone saying, well, you're not a diplomat. I know, I, I'm an American, and I have every right to say what I think might be in the best service of my country. So I started writing about diplomatic potential of public health projects. I can remember once in uh, Somalia back in the early 60s, going and we were working up country. I'm talking of six or 700 miles up out of the capital with no roads or anything. And we found the cause of an epidemic. And I came back, you know, I was in the Navy, but not in uniform. We were in a research unit. And went to the American Embassy and said, we know the cause of this epidemic. It was like a biblical epidemic. And people were dead mm. in the streets. And this was 1963. And I remember them saying the ambassador was too busy. I don't know how you could be busy in Mogadishu in 1963 anyway <laughs> to start with. But I walked across town. I gave the results to the World Health Organization. And there was an antibiotic that China sent in a plane load of the antibiotic, and they got the right to build the stadium and the roads. So there was a real diplomatic opportunity that had been missed in that. And I just became, I think America is often seen as a powerful and fear, fear, feared nation, but it's not seen as a compassionate nation. It's not seen as a caring nation. And so I thought these were opportunities, and I tried to incorporate that into my teaching and my writing. When the students go through the program, not only 
do they have to learn the matrix of it all? But then they have to have, how do you deal with um, <clears throat> adjusting to the, the variety of cultures they may find themselves embedded in or yeah. asked to operate in? Trying to encourage them to be humble. I mean, that's the first thing. And not to bring their own biases and prejudices there. But I set up this course where I try to simulate a humanitarian crisis. So it's a 30-day intensive living cheek on jowl, working 12, 14 hours a day. The average age of my candidates is 38, so they're not young people. They're, they're mostly field experienced people who we take out of the field and make them re sort of discover what they're doing. And we learn from them and they learn from us as the years go on. But it's, uh, the principles are not different, whether you're working in Myanmar, the culture may be different, but the principles of trying to extend safety, security, survival even, to large numbers of traumatized people, mostly women and children. And you come out of something like that with, I once wrote that I left the refugee camp, and then I said in many ways I never leave the refugee camp. No. That's all part of you and you, it's the resiliency of particularly women and children. The men are out shooting each other, but it's the women <laughs> and children trying to survive. And Different cultures, though, have different approach to medicine, including witch doctors and mm -hmm. shamans and things mm -hmm. like that. Then you worked in Africa and um, different systems. Did you learn uh, yeah, yes, something from witch doctors definitely. or shamans that broaden your medical approach? Well, I learned, first of all, that I wasn't going to be there forever, and the shaman was. So for me to come in and be uh, sort of a wizard because I had antibiotics was not serving anybody good. And I remember working in the South Sudan and finally realizing uh, very early that the man with his chicken bones and ashes was going to be their community healer when I left. And so I went to him and through negotiations and translations, I said, let me do my thing. I was doing research. So I really wanted to get specimens to determine what were the instances of diseases in the area. But I wanted him as a partner, and it works, and it does work if you can approach it that way. We too often go into situations believing that our way is the only way, or it's the right way. And very often, with, as I say, with increasing humility, you learn that the way that's going to help people is the way that there's going to be a continuity of care, mm. and not just this in and out wizardry that uh, we seem to, and there have been many examples where it has failed, and I think, um, anyway, humility is a great lesson. Always and welcomed. Wisdom. Yeah, <laughs> and, it's, and you learn. You learn from every experience of life, as, you, as we were discussing before. You never know where you are going to be or where you're coming from, and you'll go through different experiences, and they all should add to yes. the whole thing. Entertaining and uh, keeps you alert, engaged, interested. Mm -hmm. I yes, I'm uh, enchanted by life. Uh, sometimes the hard parts are challenging, <laughs> but basically. So, is there a difference in the concept of suffering in these different cultures? Yes, I think so. I think as a physician, you learn, <clears throat> and it's a very difficult lesson that you have to go even practicing medicine from one room to the next in your office, and you can't take the burdens or the suffering of one patient into the next room. You have yeah. to, and not everybody has that skill. I had a lovely young man, I was going to bring him in with me, and he was a very bright fellow, and he won all the prizes as the best internship in residence. But his wife used to call me and say, he doesn't sleep at night. He's awake all the time, and he brings the patient's problems home. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that. He went into radiology, and it's perfect. He now can look at it <laughs> for him, and he doesn't have to worry about a lot of the human elements that, uh, say, an internist or a family doctor would. You know, you've written a number of books, a few you gave me, and those uh, that you gave me I read. But you talk about the loneliness in Africa when you were isolated. Was the loneliness of a personal nature? Was it for the inability to solve problems? No. I found myself in a situation in the South Sudan where every physician had been thrown out because they were alleged by the northern government at the time that they were supporting the rebels. 
but the missionaries constituted the whole health service. And so I did find myself as a physician, probably covering an area the size of the Northeast United States, and there was nobody else around, and so there was that loneliness. Did you, there was a lesson though I learned there that I had to go to sleep at nights. And I remember the, almost the loneliness of making that decision that if someone was bleeding or dying after the second night up, I couldn't do it, and so I went to sleep. But I stayed down there for four months, and the few doctors that replaced me used to think that was immoral. They had to stay up all night. So they got evacuated after three or four days. So you have to pace yourself. You have to know what you're trying to do. There is a loneliness, and the years are different now. When I was down there in the early 60s, uh, my wife was living in Cairo, and after about four months, a soldier came into the little village of Malakau, where today the Dinka are killing the New Air tribes as they were 50 years ago. So nothing changes very dramatically in no. situations like this. And the soldier had a telegram where they used to type out the message and paste it onto a thing. And the telegram said, wife having miscarriage. Uh. And I was, had been away. The telegram was three months old when I got it. Mm. They could get it to Khartoum, but they couldn't get it through the war zone. And I remember getting a a motorboat and going up the Sobat River to the Ethiopian border, figuring someone would have a Morse code. And so there was a loneliness of being, for the first time, not in contact with any of your peers, your family, or your loved ones. And you, you found inner resources that I think, m at least in my instance, made me a much better person. You know, you were, from your books, you were very close to your wife, who has mm -hmm. now since died. How? How do you how do you have a twinkle? Can you have a twinkle in your eye? Oh, I do. It, it, it never went for me. I met my wife when she was 14 and I was 14. And by 16, I knew this was the woman I wanted to marry. And at 17, and I have to take you back to sort of an Irish Catholic 1950s family, she said I could rub her back. And I remember thinking, wow, I'm going, I've gone to heaven. I mean, this was <laughs> right. as lovely as you can. But just before she died, she said, Kevin, you have to stop being sad. Oh. We had 44 years, the most beautiful marriage imaginable, and I wouldn't have changed a thing. So I wake up every day with a twinkle in my eye, and it's still there. And I, I love life, and I love, the, I love the practice of medicine. I still see patients every morning because there's a legitimacy that comes only with that challenge of every day seeing patients that you don't know what they're gonna be. But I spend my afternoons on the humanitarian front and uh, training and developing courses. But she still has a presence. Even when I held big government positions, I used to, if she ever said, and she wasn't in medicine, I don't think that sounds like you, Kevin. I knew I was wrong. I just a moral go, compass. I'd, I would go back and take another look at this thing. And so she You were was, able to listen. I, you had to. Or hear. Both, both are important things. Yes, they to, are. To listen and to hear. Yes, I find that uh, one of the things you, you, stories you told in one of your books was is of this Jewish middle-aged farmer who has the vision a, twice mm -hmm. to be called to medicine, and he goes to the dean of the Irish Medical School and said, I would really like to be a student. <laughs> and some wise, person said yes, and then he goes off to Bangladesh after he graduates. And I, I thought a while about visions. Have you had spiritual visions? No. No, I don't think so. I mean, I have visions of the world. I, don't, I wouldn't dignify my thing by his type of thing. He got arrested over and over again, by the way, in Bangladesh. Not in the book. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, he was a wonderful man, and he was a visionary. And there are visionaries in probably every religious life. but. I, I believe in religion, but I, I wouldn't dignify my sense of the world as being visionary or, or having visions in the sense that a, a mystic has visions. No, I, I, I'm a realist, but I, 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 I read about visionaries and about mystics and about and religion and families and theology, and so I think they're all part of what we are. One of the things that I admire about you is uh, while you came from a very traditional Irish Catholic background, your work abroad and your um, 
interfacing with different religions and customs made you Catholic with a small C as well as a big C, and that you found value uh, in others, uh, other cultural approaches to things. And there was a tolerance and a respect, and I thought, oh, why can't we all have that? <laughs> you know, it's kind of a wonderful... Yeah. Um, well, I think the more you're privileged to see other cultures and live in other cultures, if you don't have respect for them, you're blind. I mean, they, every culture, for example, in New York City, the Islamic section at the Metropolitan Museum of Art is one of the great treasures of the museum. Mm -hmm. But it was closed for 10 years. And we had, I had lived in the Middle East, and when in my own practice of medicine, people would come in, and if you said Islamic, you could almost automatically insert the word terrorist after them, mm -hmm. particularly after 9-11. And you couldn't say which you can when there's a museum open. No, no, go up and look at the right. Islamic collection at the museum and you'll see a great and ancient culture. And I came away, particularly, as I say, out of the Middle East, but also out of an animistic uh, culture in the South Sudan, with great respect for the way people survive and, and thrive and learn. And as I say, if you're halfway open, to, to their, the beauty of their life, uh, their poetry, their culture. Um, and there are very different concepts of beauty, very different concepts in some cultures. You're talking visual beauty or action well, beauty? No, I mean, I even talked, I was just thinking as I was saying that, a visual, well, a visual beauty, for example, in Somalia, they write poems, bagues, about the size of a woman's buttocks. That's this great mark of beauty. And one time I was trying to convince the elders, because we had drawn a lot of blood on nomads, that I wanted to do on one of these further studies. And I kept a team in Somalia for 35 consecutive years I went there, that I wanted to draw blood on women and see if the patterns of disease mm. was different. And there was one elder and he said, no, 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 we're not gonna allow that, we're not gonna allow that. And it went on, I couldn't find, figure why he was being so difficult. And he had seen a copy of an Italian Vogue and all of these flat-bottomed Western women. He thought I was gonna take the Deflating. blood back. <laughs> I was gonna take the blood back to America and make all the women have oh. big buttocks. So I just think, you know, that, that, it was that wonderful. That, that it was his concept of beauty and he felt sorry for us with all of our flat bottom women, so. You know, um, you love words, love words. And it, it seems from your father you gained at least an opportunity mm -hmm. to hear great poets and great arguments. And um, as I said before we started, I always I thought if you hadn't been a doctor, you would have been in the field of the beauty of words. Some well, they're not mutually words. exclusive. Tell me. I, I mean, I, there are uh, you know, writers who have been physicians. Uh, the great Oliver Goldsmith practiced as a physician, as an artist. So I once wrote a paper about Irish physicians as poets. And so I think that we shouldn't ever put up barriers to say, mm. just because I'm a lawyer, I'm not going to be a painter. Or because I'm a physician, I won't you know, love the play of words. Maybe it's the Irish background. There's a great emphasis on verbal communication in the right. Irish, where not that there are some fine Irish uh, painters or artists, but it's not something that you would think of automatically, where you would think of the poet or the playwright or mm -hmm. James Joyce or William Butler Yeats. Or, and so I, I've always liked, but I, I never like to be told that I shouldn't be something because I just happen to have a title as a physician. It's kind of interesting uh, to me is your level of curiosity. And it's one of the great joys of my life, but it also, I think, it allows the world to become um, richer. But what, what I've heard about Irish society is where there's this great love of words and great love of happiness, of, of joy. There is also a, a sometimes a darker side expressed by alcoholism or... There definitely is a dark side. Uh, there's two Irish things. I've been maybe influenced by the weather. You know, 
They yes. have intermittent, if you listen to the weather report, you'll say there'll be intermittent periods of sunshine. <laughs> so that, <laughs> Sounds know, like that, Michigan. So it's, <laughs> you, you can have that, but, you know, I, I think then, again, I was president of the American Irish Historical Society for 40 years, and so I'm not a historian, but I love the, pl the play of things, and alcoholism is often cited, for example, on the St. Patrick's Day parade they talk about. And any Irish family that had relatives who were alcoholics knows the, the burden of that and the curse of that. So it is a real reality, but I think it's a little more cartoonish, frankly, than uh, you, do, you don't label other people as the Irish are all alcoholics. I, I don't buy it at all. No. And, uh, but, but I think it is a reality in too many lives, just as, you know, being oppressed by the Catholic Church was a reality for, for a long, long time in Ireland. And they're coming to an awareness of that in a hundred years after independence. I mean, when they became independent, the Catholic Church took over all of the education, for example. And so you were really in a, as they often say, a priest-ridden society. And it's only in oh. recent years that people have managed to say, no, we're citizens of Ireland. We're not always you know, right. citizens of the the Catholic Church are there, and so I think there's always been this struggle, and it's an evolving struggle. Like life. Uh, now you have five sons. How did how did you and your wife decide to raise them, value wise? What did you take from the past? What did you inject from your own times? I doubt if we ever had a serious conversation about this. I think it probably all just evolved. Mm -hmm. uh, Kate was my wife. Was she was a many, many things, but she was a potter, and she was a poet, and she was a gardener, and she was a singer. So she brought that element mm -hmm. to the family life, a very, a very important element. I was always curious, as you say, about everything. My father used to say to us growing up, you're only going to be on this earth once, and so you better go out and learn all the things you can and do all the things you can. So I had this feeling that <clears throat> was a great challenge that I wanted to share, and I had found a partner that I could share it with, and five wonderful sons, all of whom went their own ways, but I think we didn't have a plan how we were going to raise them. We weren't that organized. I don't <laughs> <laughs> well, you were certainly adventuresome if you so, took your bride to a whole different culture. I took and, all the sons to them. And the sons. Not, and I was crazy. I mean, I never took them, you know, during conflicts or war zones. But if you made a repeat visit, I think every one of them has gone to Somalia or Nicaragua. Or, but, and Kate came to, after we died, I figured I had worked in 65 countries at that time, and that was 12 years ago. But I re made another list, and she had come to 45 of those countries. Uh -huh. So it was, it was very much of a shared thing. Now, what was your mother like? My mother wasn't as influential in my life as my father, and I... We had uh, a large family, originally there were 10, and she was a wonderful woman, but it was a first-generation Irish immigrant family, and the father, my father was a family doctor. And so looking back, I've often thought how I, we wanted to get his approval or his, in fact, he had come up from the office, if you wanted to say that your brother hit you with a baseball bat, you had to write a note on the table. He would not pay attention to you if you didn't write it, which I think is why in my own life I would come home and my wife would say to me, if you are not willing to write down what you just told me, then you're just as bad as the rest of them. So I think it goes back to childhood. Write down what's important to you and have the courage to write it down and disseminate it if you think it's important. Do you think writing imposed on you a sort of a self-editing? In other words, a question, is this important enough to write down? Yeah, I've never asked anyone to edit anything of mine. Somebody said to me, how do you write these books? I said, you get a yellow pad of paper <laughs> and pencil. So I'm still very old-fashioned. I, I wake up I, you know, in the middle of the night and think of things. But I've always written, as I say, partially because I wanted to do it, partially because I, my wife would say, you, we knew we were having privileged experiences. Yes. We knew that. And Highly we knew unusual that ones. You, you had to try to share those and be as honest as you could. What do you think your wife taught you? Probably everything good in my life, I think. so. But I, 
She taught me to be honest, to be open uh, to new ideas, um, to not be afraid to say things that would be controversial, even sometimes very controversial. Because if you started hiding and making believe that this didn't happen or you hadn't mm. seen that, then I think you're just as, she would say, you're just as much of a coward as most of people are in this world. And so, How did you come to be a doctor? I know your father was a doctor and mm -hmm. two brothers are, but how did you make that choice? Again, I don't think in those, that generation there was that much choice. I was actually a classics major and a philosophy major. Uh. And I got into medical school almost on an experiment as did pre-med matter. I never thought it did matter. It was very confusing in the beginning because I didn't have very much background as pre-med, but I went through medical school and life much more influenced by, as I say, the classics or philosophy and ways of approaching problems, ways of approaching patients. And, uh, but I don't think I ever thought much about it. I think I just grew up thinking I'd be a doctor someday. And, you know, it's been a very satisfying life. And then to choose to go so much bigger, in other words, mm -hmm. to want to work abroad, that came out of curiosity. That came out, out of, of opportunities. In other words, I, in medical school, I finished most of my courses well ahead of my class. And I had this time and I went to Calcutta and I started working. I, wanted, I was always fascinated by the diseases that were taught in mm. tropical medicine. So I worked in Calcutta, but the work day was from seven in the morning to one. It was summertime, it was 1959 or 60 must have been 100, I mean, and it had to be 110 every day, and yet I thought I had gone to heaven. I was seeing diseases that I never dreamed about and seeing things. And at one o'clock, being an indefatigable American, I think I walked outside, and there was an unknown Albanian nun who grew up to be Mother Teresa, so I then would spend the afternoons working in the gutter, and I just thought the what whole thing was wonderful. What did she emphasize? What did you learn from her? You know, I don't really remember that much. She wasn't famous at the time. She hadn't founded her order. But you learned that each human being was a human being and then you cared for them to the best you could. And you provided solace, if not healing, and comfort, if not, you know, cure. Thank you. So what did we learn today? We learned that before you're a doctor, you're a humanist. And that you bring in the very broad range of human experience to your doctoring. And the role of physician can be way bigger, not only by definition of healing, but participation in the wider world. And as he said, he didn't want to be limited by being a physician. And also he had the good luck to have a great wife <laughs> who uh, lived with his dynamic. And he learned to tolerate some of the challenges of life, such as not knowingness and loneliness and death. So I encourage you to live a vice of adventure, curiosity, do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know today, tomorrow, and all this week. And I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you. To contact Junia, send her an email at info at juniadone.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadone.com. Thanks for joining us. See you next time for Uncommon Sense with Junior Doan. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.